Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. The Fun Palace was an idea conceived originally by Joan Littlewood, one of the most prominent and influential British theatre makers of the 20th century, with architect Cedric Price back in the early 1960s. Their building-based idea was never built, but writer and actor Stella Duffy at OBE came up with the idea to resurrect it in a different way for Littlewood's centenary in 2014. This has become a fast-growing annual event co-directed by Stella with Sarah Jane Rawlings and is about to celebrate its fifth anniversary. I asked Stella to explain what their version of Fun Palaces is, is all about. OK, so this is the spiel that I normally give when people say, so what are Fun Palaces? In approximately 1961, we don't know for sure, even though people have now taken me saying approximately 1961 and taken it for gospel fact, Joan Littlewood and Cedric Price, I don't think I need to explain who Joan Littlewood was for your audience, but, you know, the amazing, wonderful, sadly undershouted about theatre director, although hopefully Sam Kenyon's musical that's just finished at the RSC will help a bit with that. Anyway, Joan and Cedric had an idea for a building, and it was going to be a building that housed arts and science, things that we would now call digital. So they had a dream of, this was going to be specifically in the East End where Joan was working, and they had a dream of uh, showing football live. I'm pretty certain it wasn't available live in 1961. They wanted to show a screen that had feed from the monkeys in the zoo, knowing that the people in the East End weren't going to the zoo because it's, well, too far away and too expensive. And this this was going to be an amazing building. And being Cedric Price, he um, designed an astonishing thing, which Richard Rogers says he used as the base for his Pompidou Centre in Paris. And of course, it never happened. The building was in 1965, it was going to cost £5 million. In 1975, it was going to cost £15 million. And I mean, they had an amazing board. You know, they had Yehudi Menyon on the board. They had Buckminster Fuller on the board. But it didn't happen. I personally think now, from this context, that one of the reasons it didn't happen, partly because it was so expensive, and partly because Cedric Price was committed to building things that got demolished eventually. He really didn't believe in in designing something that lasted for 100 years or even 50 years. So the man was so far ahead of his time. But I think what it was saying, what they were saying, was that culture in its broadest form was for everybody and not just as consumers, but as active participants. And I think this is this is one of the problems that theatre in particular has had with this idea. And I say this as somebody who's, you know, got my equity card when I was 18. It was my first ever proper job. I've, I've worked in theatre, I'm 55 now, I've worked in theatre on and off freelance since then. But we, we've so stuck to dividing ourselves between the performers and the audience. And, you know, Joan certainly wasn't a believer in the fourth wall, and neither am I. And, and this great divide where we say we're the ones creating and you're the ones sitting there or standing there and, and um, lapping up what we do, and that that's enough. And Joan had, had a quite a sort of very different perspective on this. And I think she'd had it, you know, ever since she was first working with Theatre Workshop. They were working with communities all along and not as the actors coming in to tell the communities what to do, but to work with the communities and find out what they wanted to do to co-create with them. And she'd done that touring for a long time before she came to Stratford East. So anyway, they had this idea that never happened. So fast forward to Devoted and Disgruntled, Improbable's annual theatre open space, which I've been to every one of since they started as um, an Improbable associate artist and sometimes performer with Improbable. Occasionally I've facilitated a couple of open spaces for Improbable. And it was January, I remember exactly, it was January the 26th at D&D. And I'd been working with a large ensemble for about three years co-creating a show entirely in open space, sometimes with 30 people in the room, sometimes with 10, and the age range was from 17 to 70. And I, I knew I needed to know more about working with ensembles. I wasn't directing as such. I was holding it, supporting other people to direct the, the old scene if they wanted to, supporting other people to write a scene if they wanted to. So we were co-creating in, in I think, the best sense of the word. And there was no formal hierarchy and people stepped up when they wanted to, to lead a section. And we ended up making a great show that we we're really proud of. Anyway, 
I knew that I needed to work more with ensembles. So I'd been reading a lot about Joan's work because a huge amount of her work had been ensemble work, whether it was working with public in her early touring days or working with her own companies. And I just thought, why are we not shouting more about this woman? You know, I mean, I'd, I'd known about her, her work. I mean, most of us, I guess, had known about Oh, What a Lovely War, but she's so much more than just her theatre work. You know, she'd always worked with communities. She was passionate about it and she was passionate about representing forms of reality on stage so that people recognize themselves. The inclusion and diversity stuff, decades before it was trendy, um, and decades before far too many people were using it merely as tick boxes, she said angrily. Anyway, you know what, I can't just say that. I mean, I want people to be more inclusive and I want our work to be more diverse, but we're not going to have that. And this goes back to fun palaces, unless we are supporting everyone to create. You know, I get really annoyed when I hear of venues talking about wanting their audiences to be more diverse. Well, you do that by having your board more diverse, by having your artistic director and your executive director more diverse, by having your work more diverse. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I called this session, this D&D session, and I know because I wrote the notes for it and I've read them since. 16 people came to that session. It lasted 45 minutes. It changed my life. What, what happened was we were in a session, we were talking about what we could do. Let's not do another Oh, What a Lovely War, because there were about 150 of them. I mean, it was Jones Centenary, but it was also, you know, the centenary of the First World War. And this, this was, you know, a good 20 months ahead of her centenary on the 6th of October 2014. And we were talking about how the Fun Palace was a great idea, but it didn't happen. And one of the reasons it didn't happen was because they were trying so hard to concentrate on building a building. Which makes sense, you know, if you're looking at, at the rubble-strewn post-Second World War East End. But the problem with a building is they can only, with the best will in the world, only serve the community that's right there. They can't serve everybody, and they're not really giving it to everybody. And once you're looking after a building, you're going to have to worry about the heating and the toilets and, and you know, the parking. You're going to have to worry about all of that. So this is exactly what happened. Mark Curtis, who was at Theatre Royal Winchester, walked past, this is why Open Space is so brilliant and why Devoted and Disgruntled work so well, walked past our session where I had written on a big piece of paper, Fun Palace, question mark, where... He leaned over, he looked at the piece of paper, he said, oh, it's our 100th anniversary next year, we can make a Fun Palace, we'll just do it in the building. And then he walked off to another session. And what's really brilliant is that Theatre Royal Winchester didn't make a fun palace. And so he just dropped this idea in that actually we could do it anywhere. I think at the time I thought, OK, this is a big thing and I'm not sure I could do it. It felt like it was real. It felt like it didn't feel like a here's a maybe it'll be it'll be a tiny thing and that's fine. I tweeted about it and very quickly Emma Wyman, who I think had just moved to the ROC or was in the process of doing so from Northern Stage, tweeted, I'm in. Gemma Bodinet at Liverpool Everyman said, I'm in. Sarah Frankham at uh, Manchester Royal Exchange said, I'm in. Jude Kelly said, she, so all these women whose lives as directors, as, as leaders were influenced by Joan, were all excited about the possibility of taking a lost idea and remaking it in their own spaces. And then we started to think that maybe, you know, it shouldn't just be theatres. So this is all still January 2013. I turned 50 that year at the beginning of March and we went away, my wife and I, for three weeks. Basically, we worked out that we could either have a big party or go to New Zealand where I grew up for three weeks in summer. So you know, obviously there was no party. While I was away... And I, that year I was, I was directing a play and I had a novel to finish writing and a novel to finish editing. That year I thought, I don't have to come home and do this. You know, I don't have to. You know, sometimes when something takes over your life, you're aware that it's, you're on the brink of it. And I thought, you know, it's all right. I don't have to do this thing, except that I kind of did. <laughs> so I got back at the end of February and I spoke to Nick Sweeting from Improbable and I said, you know, I, no, I can't do this by myself. And Nick brilliantly suggested that I speak to Sarah Jane Rawlings, who had worked at Lyric Hammersmith at Manchester Royal Exchange in learning and participation, had been my arts council officer for my second solo show, and knows a damn sight more about producing and budgets and all of those things than I still do and than I ever want to. 
So I remember Sarah Jane and I had a coffee. Now, when she tells the story, she says that I knocked the coffee cup over and spilt it all over her. That is not true. I was so nervous that she would say no. I knocked this cup over and spilt it all over the floor. But we had a coffee and I said, look, there's this thing. And lots of people are starting to say yes. And I don't think it's just for theatres because other places are saying, can we join in? There's somebody who reads my novels on Twitter and she doesn't have anything to do with the arts. And she said, can we do it? And I've just said yes, but I don't know what it is. And I don't know how we do it. And so Sarah Jane and I, for the first six months of 2013, working from our kitchen tables, and at the time her kids were small and her partner was away on tour a lot. He has a company as a performer, Paul Hunter from Top by an Idiot, and they were touring. And so Sarah Jane was literally putting the kids to bed and then we were texting each other and emailing and making this happen. And um, I went and spoke to Murray Melvin at Theatre Royal Stratford East because I thought it was I needed, I needed some permission, even though Joan was dead. And it was a thing that didn't really happen. And we were taking it and making it different anyway. I mean, there'd be two occasions where they did do something like the Fun Palace. One was, I think it was 68, when they made Bubble City on the ground near Tower Bridge. And then there was 1975, was the Stratford Fair. But neither of them were called, called the Fun Palace. And, and the dream that they'd had of the building never eventuated. But I still felt like I needed to speak to the Joan people. So I spoke to Murray. He put me in touch with Jenny, with Christine, Jenny King, Christine. Oh, God, this is terrible. Anyway, all the Joan people. I spoke to all the Joan people. Peter Rankin. Christine's amazing. Christine told me this fantastic story about clearing that waste ground in front of Stratford East and that the minute they did it, people came and parked their cars. So the next year, obviously. So the next day, she got somebody to bring along a bunch of concrete troughs so no one could park and that's where they made the Stratford Fair happen but so these were you know people who've gone on to do amazing things in their lives and no one said don't do it some people said mm, don't know I think it's too difficult it was impossible for Joan some people said yeah give it a go and and Murray and I think because he was the Stratford Easter archivist for so long because he's been so associated with keeping Joan's memory alive he just very generously said she would have loved this, go for it. I mean, he said it much more elegantly than that because Murray's very elegant. And, and that felt like a blessing, really, like a real benediction to go for it. So so we did. Towards the end of that year, we got a tiny arts council, Grants for the Arts, G4A. And Stratford East let us sit in their meeting room. And um, Sarah Jane and I brought this thing together. And then we held an open space at Stratford East. And then people came. I remember Wendy Smith came from Sage Gateshead and I was like, oh my God, there's this woman that I've only ever met on Twitter and she's coming all the way from Sage, you know, so there's really something here. And some of the Murray, Murray came, Peter Rankin came, some of the, some of the Joan people came, Christine Jackson, there it is, I knew it would come back. And they, they had Joan stories and there was, a, there was a brilliant moment where there was all these people sitting around, I think Murray and Peter on the stage of Theatre Royal Stratford East, listening to these stories. And I thought, well, if we've done nothing else, you know, there's some people here in their 20s and they're hearing from the horses' mouths how it was and how that building was. And, and that was enough in a way. But, of course, then people worked out they wanted to join in. And, you know, we, we got a lot of support very quickly. The space gave us some money to set up the website. And the website was set up really specifically so somebody who'd never even, I don't know, used a Facebook page could upload a photo. It was done so it would be really accessible. And we've, we've taken really good care with the language on that website all along to do that. We applied for, what do they call it, an, an excellence award? An exceptional award, that's it. Yeah, not excellence, can't be called the excellence. Um, in fact, I had a very early conversation with a lovely person at the Arts Council who said, yes, but Stella... How are you going to guarantee the excellence? And I said, name redacted, I'm not going to guarantee the excellence, but I'm going to guarantee the excellence of engagement, and you guys never do that. And I, obviously, uh, I've been popular ever since. But we knew that if because of the people who were saying they'd like to join in, that it was going to guarantee an excellence of engagement because there were people from all walks of life, from all over Britain. I mean, we've always averaged, bearing in mind we work two days a week, we're now at the Albany in Deptford, two days a week, and we've always done two days a week. And there's, there's only three of us at the moment, but the most in our first year, we had um, half a dozen other people who were working with us one day a week or part-time through the Albany to kick it off and paid for by, by the exceptional award. So bear in mind how tiny we are and we're based in London. We've always been 88 to 90% outside London. 
We're hugely proud of that. We've always been really diverse in terms of ethnicity and in terms of socioeconomics. So last year, 20% of fun palaces in England, for which we have the data based on Arts Council England's data, 20% of them took place in the decile in the index of multiple deprivation that's the most deprived. So there should be 10%, but it was 20%. 64% of fun palaces maker teams last year included people from ethnic minorities. And in terms of our participants, 30% of our participants identify as ethnic minority. Now, we could see that from the very beginning, that people who don't normally get the opportunity to put up their hand and say, I would like to lead, or I would like to support, or I would like to create, were getting a chance to. And we don't know why, other than that, we were saying yes to everybody. And we worked really, really hard to do that, not to say, yeah, what's your qualifications? Yeah, do you have a building? Yeah, can you get some local funding to make it happen? I mean, 71% of fund palaces last year needed no extra funding. And the ones that did, I mean, you know, they're talking about a grand, maybe 1,500 quid. It's completely absurd to, to need a lot of money for it because what we're saying now now that we know more of what we're doing, because this is our fifth year, is that there isn't a human culture where people haven't created. You know, there isn't there isn't any culture where people don't sing or dance or sculpt or tell stories that are the history of their, their folklore and their ancestry. That's everywhere. And every community in Britain, every community across the world has versions of that. And in a fun palace, we just say, bring those together. Bring together your passion. Bring together something that you do, something you're excited by, something you enjoy doing and share it with other people. Now, what we know, given that we're talking specifically here about theatres, what we know is that venues, about 50% of the people who come through the door are new people who've never been to that venue before. What we know from libraries is about half the people who come sign up to become members. One of the reasons this happens is because we're, we're saying you don't need the same old people to lead it. You know, you don't need, if you're, if you've got a, so th- I'm thinking right now of Sheffield Theatres where we have a brilliant ambassador, Beverly Nunn. Beverly doesn't come from traditional theatre learning and participation departments, not to not love the theatre learning and participation department, but understandably their job is to help people learn about theatre and participate in theatre. Beverly's a community worker. She's not about what show is on in the main house at the moment. She's about the community. Her background is as a community worker. Now, having someone like that working out of a theatre, because this is our funding from Welcome and Hamlin, and we have these ambassadors around the country, they're also paid two days a week. And their job is not to make a fun palace. It's to support people in the local community to co-create and co-curate by and for themselves perhaps using the venue. So at Sheffield Theatres, Beverly's been working with communities that you know people have never been in the building, let alone come to see a play. And why would they? Because they, you know, they don't necessarily see that it's for them if their families aren't theatre goers. You know, if they've only ever been to theatre on a one-off school visit, then you're not necessarily going to go, um, oh, well, yeah, theatre's for me. I know. I'll risk going into a building where I don't know anybody and I don't know how you book a ticket and go and do that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a huge ask that we have with these shiny buildings we've got. It's a massive ask. And the ask is cross the doors, cross the threshold, come to a space you don't know. I know because not everyone has the internet, not everyone has access to booking tickets or something on the internet in any way. You still don't know what to wear when you get there. So Beverly's going out and, and being with the community and she's not saying come and buy a ticket to our play. She's saying, would you like to come and meet, um, come and do something in our foyer? Have you got something you'd like to share? This way people begin to understand the building. She's made connections between um, a rag rug making group and the wardrobe department. You know, that's the way that we make connections. And I think it's really, it, it's so clear to us and clear to Sheffield Theatres as well, who, who came in when Daniel Evans was there and are now still very positive and very supportive of Fun Palaces with Rob Hasty there. They came in because they know that they want to reach and work with the communities that they haven't been reaching in a different way, rather than calling it outreach, you know, rather than, oh, the rudeness of calling people hard to reach. You know, they're not hard to reach if you go and stand with them. They're not hard to reach if you are them. And that's where we need to see the change. If we genuinely want an inclusive and diverse theatre 
in the 21st century. And I certainly do. And, you know, because look at Dave O'Brien's studies into current theatre. We're more middle class and more white than we've ever been. It's utterly heartbreaking. If we want to make change, if we genuinely want to include everybody, we're going to have to include what we put on the stage. We're going to have to include how we put it on the stage. You know, this this whole idea of you sit down, shut up and sit in the stalls and don't even rattle your lolly, your sweetie paper, let alone your mobile phone, while I stand up here in the light and declaim a bit. I know not everyone declaims. I know that that's rude. But even so, you know, that's a very 17th, 18th century idea of theatre. It, it comes from when our theatres became enclosed. It certainly didn't exist in Shakespeare's time. It certainly didn't exist when the Greeks invented Western theatre. I mean, admittedly, only men were allowed to go and only men were allowed to perform. But the whole point about theatre is that we sat in the light in, the, in with the Greeks. We saw each other. We felt and we emoted and we were loud and we shouted and we booed and we hissed and we probably did, I don't know, chat to our neighbours because it was meant to be a cathartic joint experience. You know, so many people make theatre that they kind of really rather was a film, really. They'd really rather that it was preserved, it was precious, and the audience, yeah, it's nice to have them there, but we don't want to hear them. We don't want them coughing, you know, in winter time when they bothered to come out and pay money and come out in the dark and cold. We don't want their, their child making a noise. Yeah, yeah, the rudeness of, of this fourth wall rubbish, it makes me crazy. Anyway, cut the rant later if you like. Sun Palaces says it's got nothing to do with that. Fun Palaces says it's about opening our buildings, our publicly funded buildings, I might add, and saying to the people who pay these publicly funded buildings, it's yours. This is your local theatre. This is your local gallery. This is your local art centre. Your taxes are paying for this. Your lottery tickets are paying for this, particularly your lottery tickets. It's yours. How would you like to use it? And then supporting people to do that. And that does go right back to Joan Littlewood because very early on, very first conversation I had with Murray Melvin talking about fun palaces, he said, you know, when Joan worked with what she called her nutters, the kids from, from Stratford East, the kids who were literally, according to the stories I've been told, just hanging around, smashing windows, what else was for them to do? So she brought them into the theatre and improvised with them and, and did stuff, but she asked them what they wanted to do. And having asked them what they wanted to do, she then asked them, great, and how are you going to do it? So again, we're not saying we'll do it for you. So the work that we're doing with fun palaces, with supporting communities, is instead of going, great, so I'll send an artist to you and the artist will talk to you and the artist will write a lovely play and you'll be in it. We just say, well, why don't we support them to be the artist? You know, why don't, why don't we support the community to create? Why don't we let them, why don't we trust that that community, and I'm thinking of some of the communities Beverly at Sheffield is working with, you know, refugee and asylum seeker communities, why don't we trust that these people were probably running buildings themselves where they used to live? You know, why do we have this appalling patriarchal hierarchical standard around culture, which is so the core of humanity? So that was a very long introduction. Fun palaces. Fun palaces says with no qualms at all that we believe in Jones phrase, the genius in everyone, that any community can create for itself, that every community should be supported to create for itself. And I think another reason that Jones building didn't happen is that it would have been great for the people of the East End, but only for those people, because it would have been one, one building in one space. And that would have been great for them. But our version of, of the Fun Palace ideal says it can happen anywhere. And we do do it at the same time because that way we're able to, to unearth great things that are happening. People show us great things that are happening all year round, but they just happen to bring them together on that weekend. And we're able to shine a national and now beginning to be international light on some astonishing stuff that's happening in communities that often that don't get a light shone on them, you know, or, or if they do get a light shone on them, it's because of bad things happened. One of the things we're proudest of is, you know, the way libraries have jumped in. You know, libraries have really suffered with central government cuts to local governments and, and some local governments seeing libraries as an easy place to cut money when actually, you know, for most people, certainly someone like me from a, from a council estate in South East London, and then I 
grew up in a timber town in New Zealand where most people, including my parents, worked shift work at the mill. You know, the library for me was my introduction to, to anything to do with culture. We didn't have that access at home. And it wasn't for want of trying, but my mum and dad had both had to leave school at 14. That they just simply, we didn't have that in our lives. So for me, a library is a, the beginning of access to any form of culture, just as a theatre could be if we weren't so daunting about these lovely shiny glass and concrete buildings we keep building goodness me let's build another scary glass and concrete building you know actually somebody said to us at a workshop we ran in, in manchester and this was we do a lot of work with, with greater manchester rather than the middle of and they said um they were asking them, you know, how they felt about the centre of Manchester. And they said, oh, no, it's gorgeous. We always tell our friends to go there when they're visiting, always. And we said, yeah, but, but what about you? And they went, oh, no, we, we don't go in. Oh, no. No, no, that, that's for other people. And we hear this such a lot with fun palaces, the people that we're working with, the communities across, you know, all four British nations that we work with. People say, oh, yeah, that's lovely, but that's not for me. And for us, it can be for everybody. But it, we might have to change what we're calling culture. We might have to be more inclusive about what we call culture. We might have to welcome other people in to lead our culture in a different way than it's been led to date in order that we get the inclusive culture that we're aiming for. And, and I think we will. You know, one of the other stats that we're really excited by is that last year in 2017, so Fun Palaces are run by teams of makers and they might be 10 local people, but they might be 30. And some of them are you know, employed, it might be a, a staff member at a library or a, a producer at a theatre or a gallery, but mostly they are local volunteers and they're mostly volunteers who do other stuff but who want to get involved. They want to get involved sharing their passion, their passion for tap dancing or their passion for singing or their passion for particle physics. All of these things have happened, I promise you. And whistling, that's the one that I keep seeing. People turning up with wood and all their knives and sitting there showing people how to whittle. And, you know, because fun palaces usually happen in a public space, somebody else has paid for public liability insurance, so that's fine. We, we say it's not just for children by any means. We don't use the term family friendly because unfortunately, family friendly has come to mean for small kids. And mum and dad push the small kids forward and then they go off and have a coffee. Or the teenagers never come to something called family friendly because that, that, would, that would make them seem like they were a little kid. And people 70 plus don't always want to go either because they've brought their own kids up and they've looked after their grandkids. They want a bit of peace, thank you. So we say fun palaces are for all ages and ideally led by all ages. We've seen 10 year olds leading coding in Minecraft and grown ups learning coding in Minecraft from 10 year olds. We've seen, we've seen people in their 60s and 70s go back to passions they had when they were working full time and share those passions. And so it's, it's really about making a space available for people to share their passion. And if I bring in, I don't know, my passion, I used to be a gymnast. So if I bring in my passion for gymnastics and um, Dave, what's your passion? What's your secret other than theatre? Tell me something that you, that you do that's, yeah, something you're passionate about or enthusiastic about. You don't have to be the best at it. <laughs> I don't know. It's mainly theatre that I do. Um, computer stuff, I suppose. But okay, good, good. Computer stuff. So, okay, this is a podcast, right? So, um, I assume you know how. I, I bloody hope you do, because otherwise, I've gone on far too long. You um, know how to edit stuff, right? Okay, great. So, in a fun palace, I would totally welcome somebody sitting up a corner, you know, a microphone over here, headphones there, you know, showing other people how to record a podcast and how to edit it. That would be enormous. That would be a great gift to people who didn't have that digital expertise. It would be sharing digital expertise without having to be the one who's, you know, got the degree in it. I don't mean this in a Michael Go if we don't want experts kind of way. We welcome experts in a fun palace. Totally welcome them. But we also welcome people bringing what they're passionate about. But what would then happen is say I said, OK, I'm going to lead my guaranteed can teach you how to cartwheel in a half hour workshop. And we're going to do it over this side. I'm thinking of Sheffield because I know that foyer pretty well. Over this side, slightly distant from the cafe, but there's a big, long space. And all you need to do to do a cartwheel is be able to count to four. I promise you, it's true. I'm going to do this here. And over at that end, Dave's down there and he's got his, you know, his podcast material set up. And over here, Beverly's brought the people who, you know, work with the offcuts from the wardrobe together with the wardrobe people and they're sharing techniques. If we then advertise that on the Fun Palaces website and 
locally and our fun palace is page for each place and they have a little program you program them all at the same time you don't program them one after the other so that people who turn up for the podcasting will go oh this is i'm here and i've learned something oh what's happening over there oh my goodness there's some people doing cartwheels i've always wanted to know how to do a cartwheel those people who wouldn't come if you'd said we're doing a workshop in cartwheeling will come for the podcasting workshop, will stay for the cartwheeling workshop, will get chatting to the person doing the rag rug making, will have different conversations. And that's the other reason why we say Fun Palace's activities need to be participative. They need to be hands-on. It's never okay to do a show and call it a Fun Palace unless you do the show, stop every 10 minutes, change the cast by getting people up from the audience. I think Joan would love that. Teach them what to do and then let let them take over. That would work because basically it's about handing over. It's about handing over control. It's about letting people discover stuff that they didn't know that they were interested in. One of the the loveliest quotes that that helped us get a lot of science people involved was uh, Elizabeth Glennon, Dr. Elizabeth Glennon, UK Alzheimer's Research Fellow, to give her her full title, who works at King's College in South London. And um, she's worked on uh, Fun Palace three years in a row at a swimming pool, at Brockwell Lido Swimming Pool. And she said, when I do an open day at the Maudsley Hospital, I get people who know they're interested in neuroscience. When I do an experiment at a Fun Palace, I get people who didn't know they were interested in neuroscience. So for us, that's the key. And I'm, I'm thinking of a Fun Palace that's happening this year in Cornwall, in Penzance. It's two estates and they're working together to run their Fun Palace. And instead of the gallery and the museum saying, come to our gallery and museum, we're a lovely shiny building. The estate have invited the gallery and museum into their Fun Palace. So the Fun Palace is on the estates and the gallery and museum are bringing themselves to it. And that's what I think our, our theatre buildings could be doing. You know, yes, we could be giving over the foyer space for a fun palace and that would totally work or the main space or the studios or the bit outside, whatever. But actually supporting a community to create their own fun palace where they live, supporting them to do what they want where they live and bringing our thing to them is so much more generous. You know, it's it's so, I mean, yes, it's a bit more hard work, but, you know, suck it up. Seriously, this is, this is what I think about this, right? You're allowed to cut everything else, but you're not allowed to cut this. We are living in a time where Boris Johnson gets to be rude, so rude, about women and their choices around faith. Yes, some women are forced into burqa, not all. We are living in a time where Donald Trump gets to separate families at a border, and that happens in British detention centres too. We are living in these times. Those of us who have the great privilege to work in culture might just have to suck up that we've got to work a bit harder because times are a bit bloody hard, you know? We might just have to suck it up. Yes, it's hard. Yes, we're underpaid. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, many of us work many hours for free. But bloody hell, we're not a refugee sent out of our country to a detention center where we've been separated from our kids for three months. If we're not that, then I think we have a duty to do more. And I love that people see fun palaces as one way, not the only way, of course there's many ways, but as one way to do more, as one way to integrate a bit more, as one way to be a bit more inclusive, as one way to support other human beings. Right, well that was quite an introduction, but... (laughs) It, uh, I'm so sorry. No, oh, dear. It uh, does open up a few things that, um, uh, well, <laughs> well, there's lots of things. I, I agree with uh, with a, a lot of what you've said. I mean, libraries were very important to me when I was growing up. I, I don't tend to go to libraries. I'm lucky enough to almost live in one. I've got that many books at home these days. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was in the library all the time when I was a kid, the local library. But uh, I want to come back to Joan Littlewood. If you look at her description, I mean, she did have that idea she always had that idea even before she was in Stratford East of of having some kind of educational establishment attached to a theatre she was trying to set one up in Merseyside at one point I think before she even went to London but her description if you read her descriptions they're in very Marxist terms it's very political oh yeah 
the link with Brecht is very clear because Brecht's learning plays, his Lehrstücke, they were meant, it's often forgotten now, they were meant to be performed by the people who were learning from them. They weren't, they weren't, yeah, meant, yeah. They weren't meant to be performed on the stage, like you were saying, yeah. with, with people watching. So that, that she was obviously, everybody knows she was heavily influenced by Brecht. So her, her political motivations were very clear and, and she talks, uh, this was a post-war period, when she's talking about things that in education would come a bit later uh, with like the student revolts of, of students having control of their own education and what they learn. Yep. Obviously, from what you just said, you're politically motivated in many ways, but it, what's politically is uh, fund policies doing in current society that, that sort of links with what she was doing in, in the 60s, do you think? Um, well, I think because, as I was saying, about people bringing along their passion and sharing it with others, we're very clear that it's still a learning concept that at a fun palace, you want people to in, to join in, you want them to have fun and an opportunity to learn what they want to learn rather than us, you know, telling them what to learn or saying, here, theatre is very good for you. You should come to theatre and join in because it's good. I mean, I believe it's good for you. God, it's been great for me. It did, did amazing things for me. But it doesn't really help to tell people it's good for them. It helps to say to people, what excites you? What are you passionate about? What would you have to share? Because actually, when we support people to share what they have to share, they also feel like they've, they've, they've given something. So ideally, a, a sort of perfect fun palace would have 20 different things going on all the time. And every now and then, you'd turn up at the corner where somebody was going to teach you how to make a podcast, and that person would he, it had buggered off because actually what he was doing was he, he was off learning, you know, from the, the local particle physics expert. And there's a, there's a sign that says, I'll be, you know, back to run a, a podcast session in half an hour. And then you'd be drawn by something else. So the idea that we can learn from each other, I think, is really huge in terms of fun palaces and that we can do it in our own communities that we don't have to, you know, this goes back to the times we're living in. And I think of my work for, for 35 years in the arts. I have often gone to other places to take my art. I have hardly ever done stuff in my own community for and with where I live. And I think you could, that's probably true of most people in theatre. It's certainly true of many writers. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with other people's communities, and that's lovely, and we all love it. But we hardly ever do it right where we live. And the fun house gives people an opportunity to do something right where they live. But I think the political part about that is, A, it's handing over. B, it's cultural democracy rather than the democratization of culture, which suggests that culture is good for you and we must make it accessible to everybody, but only accessible to consume, not to create. And that's where I think we've gone really badly wrong when we talk about access, because when we're talking about access, if we only mean audiences, it's not enough. We have to change access to who creates our culture. That's where the big shift, I think, I hope will come. Because when we do that, we get a new culture. You know, we get away from the Warwick Report's heartbreaking 8%. Now, there's many there's many problems with that 8%. One is that if you say that the people accessing the bulk of funded culture are the 8% who are the whitest and richest, well, for a start, that's awful. But part of that problem is that because culture in that context was only considered theatre, ballet, opera, literacy, it, it's not it's not street dance. It's, you know, it's not hip hop. It's, it's not... God, I don't know because I'm 55, but it's not what the 17-year-olds are making now, is it? So, I mean, they might be doing ballet as well, but I was with a, one of my god kids yesterday and she's making promos. She's 16 and she's making music promos. Well, that's culture. Of course that's culture, but it doesn't get counted when we count what's culture. And the fun part idea of political and that says that what you have to contribute is your culture. Um, and, and that culture should include what you have to contribute and what you're passionate about. And that therefore, and I think this is number eight or nine of our objectives, resources should be uh, allocated appropriately. We put that in our objectives and no one seemed to realise how radical it was and no one's told me off yet. So maybe everyone agrees we should be reallocating resources to include everyone's uh, culture. Maybe that's not a radical thing to say. I don't know. But it's been in our objectives for 18 months now and no one's said a word. So I think that that's part of it. I think that our links with other organisations that are both less radical and more radical than us are useful. We've seen 
Fun Palace's organisations go on to do more political things after they've made a Fun Palace or two. And that's really exciting. So Boundary Estate in um, Tower Hamlets in London, they're the oldest planned council estate in Britain. They're at the top of Brick Lane. They have second and third generation British Asian families. They have white working class families. And because they're at the top of Brick Lane where it's Shoreditch, they also have, you know, very fancy, groovy young people working in media who can afford a flat, a one bedroom flat for £900,000. With their fun palace, they've been able to work together. And with their second year of their fun palace, they worked more together. And this year, even more so. And now they're running a monthly thing called Beyond the Bounds, which is a monthly debate discussion with that local community, with those three very disparate local communities working together. Now, that to me is an absolute direct line to Joan Littlewood, you know, walking off the West End stage and trying to walk to Manchester um, and collapsing at Burton on Trent, and when she finally gets to Manchester, saying she could, what is it, something gorgeous in her in Joan's book, which is called Joan's book. Whenever you say Joan's book, people don't know what you're talking about. It's called cool. Joan's book. Um, she says, I, I could, I could smell the grit and the wind and the smell of communism off the pen, Pennines. It's something like that. Yeah. No. So I mean, you know, we're all about. We, we've got the reallocation of resources, and we've got cultural democracy, and we've got people leading for themselves. Now, to me, that's the core of it. And lifelong learning is huge. I mean, the other thing that Joan and Cedric said in their draft blueprint for the Fun Palace was um, lie back and look at the stars, try starting a painting or a riot. Um, you know, she, she, wasn't, she wasn't scared. And then, and then she wonders why she couldn't get the funding for the bill. Um, you know, she wasn't scared of putting things out there. I, I'm not sure. People have said to me, you can't, that's on our website. People have said to me, well, you can't say that. You know, riots are terrible. I'm like, well, yeah, obviously. Um, you know, I live in Brixton. The last lot of riots, that, um, what was it, four years ago, five years ago? Maybe longer now. I went down and I shopped from every single independent shopkeeper I could find the next morning just to know how loved they were. Of course, riots are not a great thing, but let's look at why people are rioting. You know, when Joan says try starting a riot, She's saying, look at what this is. What happens if you try to make a change? Maybe you don't get to. Maybe the system stops you. Maybe you're too scared. But what happens if you try to make a change? So I don't think we're saying that fun palaces in and of themselves are the change. I think that would be ludicrous. And I don't have time for that to be the case. But I do think they are supporting what I think we really want at the moment, which is a public voice where people can genuinely have dialogue. So another one of the things that, that's happened is that we've seen people who, migrants to Britain, have told us that making a fun palace has made them feel more integrated locally. And I think that's because they've led it, rather than it being led for them. I think it's really important that those of us who've had the great privilege of working in culture for such a long time don't think that we have the answers. Don't think we have any answers, actually. I mean, the thing with fun palaces is we're constantly, as Murray told me, Joan said, of the kids, you know, ask them what they want to do and then help them do it. And that is sometimes people say to me, well, if they're all doing it and they all just have to sign up to the website, what do you do? <laughs> and I'm like, well, good question. I spend a lot of time persuading people that what they want to do is okay. And that's really heartbreaking, actually. You could tell because my voice has gone very quiet. It's really heartbreaking to talk to people, I don't know, 20, 30 years younger than me, who already think that their plans can't come to fruition. Or to talk to people in their 70s who have seen their plans not come to fruition and who've given up. And Fun Palace is because we're so small, because we actually say to people, make a messy one. Make a Fun Palace that's a bit rubbish. Don't, allow it to not go to plan. You know, allow your plan to go awry and allow the magic in. And, you know, luckily I have been an improviser for a very long time. So I know that when plans don't work is when the best thing happens. Um, but not everyone knows that. And that, that's scary for people. And I get that. But when people risk a tiny bit going off piece a tiny bit, going off plan a tiny bit, and they begin to see that other things might develop, that's what really excites me. And that's where I think that it's very grassroots. It's very messy. It's very small. We call them tiny revolutions because one person in one town getting to lead one thing for two hours may not change a lot for other people 
but it might change everything for that one person. And that's that will ripple out. There's, I, I probably went off on a tangent on that, on the, but, but that's, that's where it's political for us, I think. Well, that, that and where we've noticed that um, quite a few funders, not, not just because of us, obviously, I mean, lots of people have been saying this, but in the past few years have gone from saying art for everyone to art with everyone, which is great. We'd quite like them to head towards art by, for and with everyone, and they're welcome to drop the great or excellent or high quality, which is not to say that they shouldn't be making it. It's just that you've set up a barrier to access to create the minute you say it has to be great because so few people have the balls, and I'm using that word consideredly because, you know, it's more likely to be the white middle-class privileged man who has the balls to say, yes, what I'm doing is great than it is a young woman, a young queer guy, a non-binary person, a person of colour, a disabled person. It is more likely to be a person from privilege who says, yeah, I can do great, let me at it, than the rest of us. And one day, those men are going to know that they're not the majority. And that will change everything. Because when the privileged probably... Oxbridge educated, probably privately educated, middle class or posh man, white, able-bodied, heterosexual, binary to the death, realises that he's the minority because the rest of us are the majority. That will change everything. It's not happening anytime soon. So, you know, any of the men listening who are a bit worried, don't worry. You'll be fine for a bit, loves. Yeah, I think I fall into a few of those categories, certainly. <laughs> Uh, but the uh, the diversity... The, All of them, though, so that's OK. Uh, the diversity, obviously diversity is something that's very prominent at the moment because it's it's become a requirement. I mean, the, the BBC is trying to show how diverse it is by changing everything, and... But it's the diversity that you're talking about is something that, that's grown naturally. It's not something to, like yeah. you said before, to tick boxes. Yeah. Whereas sometimes diversity is what, how people show off how diverse they are and use it to attack yeah. other organisations. Look, look how more diverse than you we yeah. are being. But the, the diversity is, is, is something that's grown from just opening up to everybody, really, isn't it? Yeah, if you say yes to everyone and then you help them to do what they want, what they want you get diverse work. I mean, it's, it's really, it seems so simple to me. And it's happened. I say that with an awareness that for all I know, everyone who signed up to make a fun palace this year is a bunch of lovely white middle class people who, who've suddenly gone, oh my God, that looks lovely. Who knows? But, you know, the, at the very least, we're still probably 90% outside London, if not more, looking at how many have signed up so far and where they are on the map. At the very least, we're in areas of major socioeconomic deprivation because I can see that that's already happening. You know, it's really interesting that the questions that we're not yet being brave enough to ask. I mean, I would really, what we do in our surveys is we do have a tick box that lots of people do. And it had to be pointed out to us because I'd like everybody to understand that we weren't born knowing how to do diversity and inclusion either. No one is. You know, we all work it out as we go along. And um, one of our first tick boxes started with white. Uh, do you identify as white, white British, white other, blah, blah. You know, like lots of people do. And then it was pointed out to us that that wasn't alphabetical order, was it? And, uh, I mean, yeah, you could you could have an argument that says there's more people in Britain who are white. But I think if, if we're going to try and be inclusive, we could at least start in alphabetical order if you're going to do a tick box. What we've discovered is actually people are much more forthcoming if we don't have a tick box, if we leave empty text for them to fill in. Because a lot of people don't see them themselves. I mean, I'm white other, and ticking an other, others me, right? It, does, you know, it, it already says I'm other, and that's not very inclusive. Whereas if I were to write my own version of how I identify that's really useful. And so what, what we do now is we ask both. We ask both before when people sign up, first sign up, we have a tick box. And afterwards, when this is the makers, this is the people who are leading, we have blank open text boxes. And we're getting much more inclusive answers because people are able to, you know, be more inclusive about themselves. 1.7% of um, people making fun palaces last year identify as gypsy traveller Romani, 
with a slash between each word because we know people use different ones. But we only knew that because they told us that. I think we need to be doing a lot more of the same around disability and health conditions. We need to be doing a lot more of the same around socioeconomic factors. For decades, I didn't identify as a working class person because like lots of working class people born in the 60s, the whole point was to not be working class anymore. If you've got any privilege of education, like I did, being the youngest of seven kids, I was the one who got to go to university. I was the one who got to stay at school long enough to go to university. None of my siblings did. So we were all grappling to become middle class as soon as we could. And what we didn't realise was, of course, being working class, the badge of honour among some circles. And the amount of people who I would call, you know, consider dead posh, who constantly tell me, oh, no, goodness me, no, I'm, I'm middle class, very middle class. I'm like, wow, your version of middle class is so different to mine. You know, so, so those, those questions are really difficult and we don't ask them. Again, Dave O'Brien and other people he's been working with, I, I cite Dave's stuff a lot because he really seems like the person, and I mean the people he's, he's working with as well, the people who are doing the stuff that gives us the data that we can then go back and say, here's where we need to do better. So just recently, I think several of us were tweeting about it, maybe last week or over the weekend, there's a whole bunch of new questions around how we might define class. We might look at what people's parents did when they were a certain age. And, and that's really interesting because I see that um, they've got things like teacher and nurse and they're not quite you know they're not the ones right down the list they're not the ones right at the top of the list they're certainly lower middle but that interests me because my dad was a manual laborer and um, my mum was a clerk she couldn't touch couldn't do any of the so so they come further down and I've had conversations with people who said oh no but, but I'm working class you know my dad was a teacher and my mum my mum a nurse and they seemed posh to me you know the people with, with proper jobs like that my dad literally was a manual labourer so this this version they've got has way more gradations and it's really useful I think and I think we, it would really help if we would all just get over talking about this and be a bit more honest about it we would find that we could be more inclusive because we were being open about these things. And I think they change when we're open about them. I think it's very hard to change stuff. Even if we know we're not inclusive, if we know we're not diverse, it's very hard to change things if we feel like we can't put up our hand and go, yeah, we're not there yet. You know, we didn't do it yet. We're trying. We might need some help. We might need some support. We're not there yet. I think it's really okay to say we're not there yet. It's not okay to say we're not there yet and the people who need to do this for us don't exist. That's not okay. Or, or we're not there yet because, oh my goodness, black people just don't want to come to theatre. Yeah, it's not okay to say that because what's clearly happening in that case is you're putting on the wrong theatre. It's not okay to say we did this and they didn't come. Maybe we need to be helping them to do this so that they can come. I think outreach is a dangerous word. I think hard to reach is a rude phrase and I think cold spot when we're talking about places that we have decided we in the centre have decided don't have culture is utterly offensive so get rid of all of them say we're not very good at it yet promise to get better do the work do the work yeah there you go <laughs> and it's not easy it's not easy you know, we're trying to change the world. It's not easy. It's okay to have small victories. It's okay to have days where nothing changes. None of it's easy, but it's bloody worth doing. So that's what you're doing two days a week. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, What are you doing the other five days a week at the moment? I know you've got you're launching um, a book at the Edinburgh Book Festival next week yeah. and at a few other festivals. So what what else have you got on the go at the moment? <laughs> I mean, the truth is, of course, I'm doing this five days a week uh, or seven days a week, eight, um, because Fun Palace has never stopped. I mean, we've said this. We could we could have it. We've only got this core team of three and we've got these five ambassadors around the country. We could have a core team of 15 and the work wouldn't stop. We, in fact, we, we've been talking to some some funders who look like they may be coming to support us next year because we don't have any core funding and we really, obviously, we really need it. And we've been talking about how we don't want to grow our central team. I mean, we might, we, we definitely need one more person and we might need to do an extra day. But we want to keep a really small central team because just like when you have a building and you have to look after the, the heating and the toilets, if you have a big core team, 
then you've just got a whole bunch more management to do. And I don't want that. I, I want me to always be able to talk to Farm Palace's makers if they need to have a chat, or Kirsty or Sarah Jane. I want our ambassadors to always feel that they can come directly to us and that they can also run things entirely by themselves because I don't know what should happen in Cornwall, but the Cornwall ambassadors do. I don't know what should happen in Scotland, but the Scotland ambassador does. I want it always to feel as, as open and as fleet of foot <laughs> as that. So um, so I might end up doing this three days a week. Um, at the moment, I am anyway. And I, I started a new novel. That's my 17th. I started that on Monday. This week, I do have the great good fortune of having Monday, Wednesday and Friday to write a novel. And I mean, I will end up doing some fun palaces stuff too, but officially they're novel writing days. That doesn't, that almost never happens. I mean, the book that came out in March, I mostly wrote last year on trains and planes because I did a lot of fun palaces travel and that's fine. I didn't go to, I didn't stay in a hotel until I was 27. And I first went on a plane when I was 11 and I first went on a train when I was 12. So I get to sit on a plane and someone brings me a cup of tea and do some writing. I am not complaining. So yeah, uh, trains and planes and writing. I'm working on a short opera um, as a, uh, I use this word with great trepidation, librettist. Tate or Tate, which are a fantastic company. I was having a conversation with Bill Banks Jones, who runs Tate or Tate years ago, about how look, I just got opera too late. You know, I've, the operas I've seen, I've seen because friends were in it. My family weren't the kind of family to go to an opera, let alone listen to opera. I think some things you might need to get early, and I got it late. So it still makes no sense to me. I still don't see why it has to be so expensive. I still don't understand why we might stop the narrative action, applaud somebody and give them a bouquet. I just, I don't get it. And, I, and I've been working with some amazing opera makers who don't behave like, you know, in a very traditional manner. So I, I understand, of course, there's fantastically much more accessible opera. And Bill said, well, maybe a way for you to get it is to do some. So um, I've written two, a tiny, I mean, they're like five, 10 minute pieces that um, Tate and Tate have done in the past. And this year I'm working with a new composer and I'm really excited to, to give you a wonderful, wonderful um, circle right back to Joan because uh, I'm working with an amazing composer called Suzanne Lolliver, who's just phenomenal. She's um, British Iranian and she's just brilliant. But also my friend Mary O'Connor, who teaches Dalcro's work and therefore does Laban work, which Joan did with her companies, and Jean New Love came in to teach them. Mary's going to be working with us from the beginning. This is short, so we probably only need the, the evening we've set aside. But the three of us are going to have an evening in September, and we're going to get in a room. And before I do any more writing and before Suzanne begins to compose, we're going to work on beats and Laban things, I say things because I know nothing, and Dalcro's things that Mary can teach and share with us. And this is just my friend who I've directed in plays, who's gone on to become this amazing, you know, she's an amazing musician, but she's now teaching Dalcro's work and it's fantastic. So, so I'm doing that at the moment officially. And I have a piece out in Granta magazine. Uh, this week, which I've never been a grant before. Suddenly, I think I might be a proper writer, you know, with all the literary kids. Uh, that's very fancy. Yeah, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, a novel, an opera, fun palaces. And oh, and I've got two short stories I have to write, one for Radio 4 and one for an anthology. Lots of writing bits, but writing bits are great because writing is so, you can carry it anywhere, you know, you can just carry it anywhere, which is why we're lucky. We, I don't need a stage. Mind you, I'm not sure all theatre does. The fifth Fun Palaces event will be on the 6th and the 7th of October 2018. For more information on Fun Palaces near to you or details of how to create a Fun Palace of your own, see funpalaces.co.uk. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.